can go back. You know, we'll put them somewhere else uh, sometimes with other agencies. But now that the the government is much better set up with their um, childcare arrangements in Thailand, we will put them with the government, whereas in the first place we wouldn't because we weren't overly trusting of them. But they've come a long way. The role of the authorities in this has got to be interesting too because are you often dealing with corrupt police who, are, who have been conscripted into this business by, by, uh, by the criminals running this trafficking system? Yes, that's, uh, that's a problem that we deal with all the time. <clears throat> Just to give you an example, I was in a brothel once looking for a Shan girl that I'd gotten some intelligence on. She was supposed to be about 14. And while I was waiting for her, the madam of the brothel came up to me and said, oh, would you mind leaving? And I thought, uh-oh, I've been compromised here. And I said, oh, why is that? And she said, well, um, the police are going to raid in about 15 minutes. And I said, how do you know? And they said, she said, well, they rang us. <laughs> so what happens is that the police, and I don't want to be unfair to the Thai police because there, we have a lot of good Thai police that work with us. But uh, there is an element there that are either, um, they either own the brothels, police who own the brothels, police who um, work for the brothels, or police who take kickbacks to either warn the brothels of oncoming raids or um, to look the other way. On the conversation hour this morning, my guest is John Curtis, although that's not his real name. He's also known as the Grey Man. He's a former Special Forces commando who set up an organisation to rescue children in Southeast Asia from child prostitution, and his organisation is, is called the Grey Man. Has any child ever blown the whistle on you in a situation where you've said, I'm, you know, I'm, are you happy about being here? Have you ever had a child sort of pipe up and, and, and shout out, look, I've got someone, and, and identify you as someone who's there to, to take them away from the brothel? No, I've, uh, I've actually been, uh, been lucky with that. I'm not sure why, because um, that's obviously something that could happen, but we managed to avoid that. It has happened to a friend of mine uh, a long time back. He was involved in this type of thing, and he went into a brothel once, uh, and a girl yelled out, you know, thinking he was some kind of undercover policeman because he'd, he'd already uh, spoken to her earlier to try and get her out and uh, she called an alarm and he and his two uh, associates had to run, jump in a vehicle and drive off as they were being pursued by these people from the brothel and one of them jumped on a motorbike and was following them, shooting at them and he said that uh, when he was telling the story he said that uh, he could hear the the pings of the the bullets ricocheting off the back of the car, but he was more concerned at how badly their driver was driving. He thought he'd be killed in the car crash before the bullets ever did the job. So it's it, it is a it is a possibility, but it hasn't happened to us yet. Are these brothels often um, what's the word I'm looking for? Guarded by uh, by armed armed men? In in some places they are, but for the most part in Thailand they're not. Um, because they don't know much about us, they're not really geared up to protect against us, I suppose. But in other places like, for instance, uh, Malaysia, we well, like we have covert equipment like uh, cameras and things like that. Now, we wouldn't get into one of the brothels that we know about. In um, Our people have been in there, but we couldn't take um, covert equipment in because they have armed guards. They have, uh, they'll do a body search on you before you go in. They have uh, camera equipment uh, watching the place. Because to them, uh, you're looking at about uh, each girl's probably worth about twenty five thousand dollars US to them. So we will be we will be confronting those places later on, but at the moment we're going for the easier targets. It sounds like you often bring covert uh, some sort of surveillance equipment in with you. Is that is that true? Uh, well, I do. Yes, sometimes. What, and are you able to tell me what what form that takes? Uh, it's um, usually. Uh, Micro cameras, small cameras that are hooked up to um, recording equipment in a backpack. Why do you do that? Well, we've only been trialling it for the last um, six months, and it's more to get, um, uh, what would you call it, uh, to get, we're starting to look at the, the whole prosecution side of it. Up to now, we've only been concerned with rescues and that, but that's only part of the issue. Once we can start prosecuting traffickers, then we will start moving towards ending the the whole process of traffic. So you're collecting evidence for a court? Yes, but we haven't really done that yet. We've just been trialling it to see how risky it is for our people. Um, so we haven't actually used it in... Yet. We've used it in brothels, but we haven't used it in brothels that have um, uh, underage children in them yet. Has your faith in Thailand's court system and its, uh, and its, and its government increased? 
uh, in recent years? It, it actually has. Uh, when I first got there, I was very dubious, uh, but they've signed a number of uh, understandings. They've put some uh, money and time into training their police. They've set up uh, some very good uh, women and child protection units, and we've uh, had meetings with them. Uh, so for me, I, I think Thailand is probably uh, leading the way in some instances in child protection in the Southeast Asia. And then there are places like uh, Cambodia, which, uh, which is politically much less stable than Thailand. And yeah, Cambodia is a real, a real worry. You know, it's, um, it's laissez-faire for pedophiles over there. It's um, a huge industry. Um, the central government's got no real control over huge parts of uh, the countryside there, does it? No, and they're still reeling from the, the Pol Pot years. You know, they've, uh, people are very mistrusting of everyone. Everyone's out to make, make a buck. You know, no one cares, really. Uh, and also corruption is much, much worse than it ever is in uh, Thailand. John, you mentioned before that it was the third biggest business for organised crime in, in Thailand. Oh, well, in the world. In, 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 in the world. Yes, trafficking, not trafficking of children, trafficking in general, trafficking of people right. is the third largest um, source of income. What's your understanding of the number of children being trafficked each, uh, trafficked each year? Well, UNICEF uh, put out a figure of 1.2 million now, the trouble with these figures is that they're always a bit slippery in that, we, you know, we don't really know. I mean, how are you ever going to tell? It could be much more than that. It could be less. But, you know, even one child is, is more than enough. Obviously, your goal is to rescue children one by one. How many, out of percentage-wise, how many children are you able to successfully rescue once you actually go in to intervene? Oh, you're probably looking at about... Actually, I've never sat down and worked out the figures, but I suppose you're looking at about... Um, hmm, maybe 40%. 40% you're able mm. to rescue. Your larger goal, though, was is what as an organisation? for the Well, our larger goal is to um, stop trafficking, trafficking in Thailand, to make northern Thailand a no-go area for pedophiles, and to uh, build up the infrastructure and support that we're providing to all of the um, villages uh, to prevent trafficking in the first place. And then once we've uh, successfully demonstrated that model, we'll start moving into other countries in Southeast Asia. And, and again, this is the, uh, the just as important part of the work that you do is, is trying to direct, uh, address the root causes of child trafficking. Yes, yeah, see, I, I got a girl out once, uh, uh, I think she was an Aka girl, uh, one of the Hill Tribe girls, and I was very keen to get her out. I took her to a, one of our partner organisations up there to see if they could give her education, and they were quite happy to do that. And she was a bit reluctant, and I offered her, I think, 3,000 baht a month to actually stay in school and leave the, the brothels. But uh, she ended up going back in because, you know, 3,000 baht a month compared to she can make 3,000 baht a night, and there's the attraction. So, and she'd been in for a while, so she'd gone past that kind of three-month period. And um, so what happened was the, um, the people at Kids Ark, which is the foundation that we also work with up there, they said, you know, paying money at the tail end would not be as effective as paying money at the front end, meaning prevention in the villages. So after that point, and that was quite early on, I decided to start focusing on the villages. So we support um, 28 children in one village with um, uh, education, and we also su provide money for their, um, their families. Is that hard for you as a, you know, as a farang, as the phrase is over there, as a white yeah, guy to go into those, farang, yes. is to go into those villages and... Uh